What is art? For me, there are two essential elements to any artwork. Firstly, it has to be made by a human. And secondly, its primary purpose must be to be appreciated by humans for either its beauty or its emotional power. In other words, to be admired more than it is used. This definition encompasses all traditional works of art, but also some items that many people would not necessarily consider artwork, like this mathematics textbook. In fact, in this video, I'm going to try and convince you that this book, an 1847 edition of Euclid's Elements, created by Oliver Byrne, is not one work of art, but two. What are elements? Scientists will instinctively think of the periodic table, devised by Mendeleev. Classicists will think of the four classical elements, fire, water, air and earth. Here, in these four paintings in the National Gallery, Joachim Beclair represents the classical elements as food. Meat, fish, poultry and vegetables, respectively. So, what are elements? Elements are foundations. They are the building blocks from which greater things can be created. The classical and chemical elements make up our world, the clairs make up most meals, and Euclid's book, The Elements from Ancient Greece, is the foundation stone of modern mathematics. What I personally love about Burns' 1847 edition of Euclid's Elements is that it uses the elements of art, the foundations from which all pictures are created, colours, shapes and lines, to relay its information. Burn, in fact, goes one step further and only uses the primary colours, blue, yellow and red, the colours from which all others are made. Byrne never says the triangle ABC in his book. Instead, he assigns the same bright primary colour as in the main diagram to equal angles, lines and polygonal regions. Here, the black square in the text refers to the black square in the diagram. Byrne's edition inspired similar chemistry books. In the Chemical Atlas by Edward Livingston Newmans from 1856, each chemical element is represented by a different coloured square. Likewise, in The Chemistry of Combustion by Ezekiel Diamond Webster from 1867, but here with circles. It's hard not to compare Byrne to Mondrian, the major contributor to the De Style movement. Mondrian's works were also based on mathematics, and you can see the same colours at play. It's also hard not to compare Byrne's edition to the Bauhaus movement, which likewise used basic shapes and primary colours. However, it is essential that we note that both the Bauhaus and de Style movements came after Byrne's book. In other words, his edition was not based on their now famous artworks. You can tell that Byrne's edition is a less pure form of design than that of Mondrian and the Bauhaus because of the ornate initials at the beginning of each proof, the long S's in the text, and the Renaissance style font used. Good works of art have to build on foundations, so what is Byrne's colourful mathematics based on, if not the Bauhaus and the de Style movements? Burns' edition is actually based on the ancient world. Heron of Alexandria claimed that it was a Pythagorean tradition, perhaps from the 6th century BC, to use colour in maths. Here, Byrne proves Pythagoras' theorem. The Renaissance-style font and long S's in Byrne's book hark back to earlier editions of Euclid, like this one from 1591 in Winchester College's collections. Byrne's edition was extremely difficult and expensive to produce, requiring immense precision, 
because each colour had to be printed individually. And, as you can see, Byrne used a lot of colours. You might be able to make out a slight misalignment on this page, where the red is higher than the blue. Because of the expense and difficulty in printing, only 1,000 copies were published originally. It was exhibited at the Great Exhibition of 1851, where the printer, Charles Whittingham, received more praise than Byrne himself. Why did Byrne make the book? His fundamental aim was not to make a work of art, even though he did. He explicitly states, we do not introduce colours for the purpose of entertainment. Byrne was an engineer and an eccentric mathematician whose work mainly focused on computing logarithms. In the book, he intended to help in the understanding of mathematical concepts, writing, coloured diagrams and symbols are used instead of letters for the greater ease of learners. It becomes easier to glance between the text and the diagram with this arrangement. There are no complex formulae that perplex. The educational nature of the book is reflected by Byrne's use of primary colours. These are the colours that you might find pinned up on the wall of a primary, or if you're in America, elementary, school classroom. Byrne focuses on allowing ordinary people to understand Euclid's complex concepts. In that sense, he is the Kenneth Clark of the maths world. Sadly, Byrne's edition was rejected by mathematicians and regarded as a mere curiosity. It became a work of art. Its primary function was to be looked at, not used. As an edition of Euclid, too many liberties were taken. And this section on ratios, where there is less geometry, is frankly confusing. There's a mix between iconoclasm and idolatry of Euclid. And Byrne's edition stimulates both sides of our brain. Reason, and crucially, emotion. I hope by now that I have convinced you that Byrne's edition is one work of art. But I said that I wanted to convince you that it is in fact... Two, the other work of art is not Byrne's edition, but Euclid's elements itself. Euclid lived from around 360 to 280 BC. His elements was a compilation of mathematical treatises. He actually discovered very little himself. Euclid begins his book with a series of definitions, axioms and postulates. The axioms and postulates are things that he asserts are obviously true, like a straight line may be drawn from any one point to any other point. Then, from these building blocks, these elements, Euclid builds up the rest of known mathematics and develops the structure of the modern proof. One of the criteria for something being art was, I said, its primary purpose must be to be appreciated by humans for either its beauty or its emotional power. But surely Euclid's elements is to be appreciated for much more than this, its mathematics, its logical foundations, for instance. However, even the first thing Euclid does is not rigorous by modern mathematical standards. He relies on intuition that these two circles actually intersect, rather than relying on his axioms and postulates. That's not to mention, he does not consider three-dimensional space. There's a beautiful symmetry and elegance to Euclid's writing, as I hope you can see on this page. His focus on geometry demands visual attention, much like traditional works of art, and Byrne certainly supplies this. The Elements appears to have been retired from being a textbook in around 1847. By coincidence, and, rather ironically, the same year that Byrne's edition was published. This was after 23 centuries of use. Euclid's elements retired to become a work of art, to be admired, not used. I hope that I have been successful in convincing you that the book was two works of art, Euclid's elements itself and Byrne's edition. And I want to leave you with two reflections. Firstly, 
As long as you accept my definition of art, not all artwork is intentional. Euclid's Elements and Burns' book were primarily intended for the use of mathematicians, or at least aspiring ones. This tower, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, was meant to be straight. And that good foundations, whether the elements of Euclid to a mathematical proof, the lines and colours of burn to an artwork, the Claire's ingredients to a meal, or the ground on which you build your tower, are essential. If you have enjoyed this video, please do visit my website, godtress.wixsite.com slash cornucopia. Thank you.